So my name is Chiradeep. I work for uh, Citrix in the uh, Cloud Platforms Group. And I'm here to tell you about uh, uh, Zen-based clouds and uh, how do you get uh, multi-tenancy in Zen-based clouds. Um, I hope most of you have heard of CloudStack or uh, even tried out CloudStack. And uh, so this is more of a uh, user level uh, talk rather than a, a developer level talk. Um, this is an idea, uh, the idea is to get you acquainted with the uh, different ways we can run multi-tenant loads in, uh, on Zen-based clouds, which is the most popular hypervisor for, uh, for public clouds. And um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about CloudStack, um, just as a refresher. Uh, I'm going to now touch on what are the challenges of multi-tenant IAS and how the uh, hypervisor does and does not solve the issue. Um, then I'll talk on uh, how we virtualize the network and uh, align with that piece of technology, something called SDN or Software Defined Networking. And then I'll talk about a quite a different piece of technology called L3 isolation, which is also used to isolate uh, tenants in the network. Finally, I'll talk about uh, CloudStack's network model. And if I have a chance, which I probably won't, I'll talk about CloudStack's native SDN approach. So Apache CloudStack was a product from a uh, startup called cloud.com. And uh, I was there right from the beginning. And uh, before we got acquired by Citrix, we uh, open sourced uh, cloud.com software as GPL in uh, May 2010. And after that, uh, we got acquired by Citrix in July 2011. And um, in April 2012, it, the software was donated to the Apache Software Foundation to incubate as Apache CloudStack. And so the, the, the the, the the brand and the uh, and everything else was donated to Apache Foundation, and after incubating for less than a year, we uh, graduated as a top level project, just like Hadoop or Tomcat or any of those other projects, as Apache CloudStack. And uh, it's a fairly mature product. Uh, we have had customers running clouds on it since 2009, so it's a good four years old. Um, and it's got just got a lot of deployment, especially after uh, uh, it was open sourced as Apache CloudStack, uh, but in, but including commercial uh, distribu uh, commercial uh, customers of Citrix. So uh, when we started building uh, CloudStack, you know we were looking at uh, Amazon as the uh, template. So uh, if you look at how Amazon builds its cloud. Um, take some commodity servers, add some networking, and some commodity storage. They use the open source Zen hypervisor. Um, then they have a proprietary uh, orchestration piece. It's not OpenStack. It's not CloudStack. It's their own uh, orchestration software. They have an API on top of that software, some of which you may be familiar with, the AWS EC2 and S3 APIs. And then uh, when you want to sign up with a credit card, et cetera, and the billing and everything else, they have their uh, e-commerce platform, which, uh, which of course, they know uh, the nuts and bolts of, which they've been doing for more than a de decade. Um, and actually, when, uh, when cloud.com saw this, uh, we also actually started with open source um, as an hypervisor. But um, not being a hypervisor company, we uh, switched to using um, uh, commercial Zen server. Um, so how can you build a um, Zen-based cloud? Uh, you can take the same uh, networking servers and storage. It doesn't have to be commodity. It can be uh, uh, world-class uh, Cisco or NetApp or what you want. You, want. Um, you use the Zen server or XCP as the uh, hypervisor platform. Use the CloudStack orchestration software, and you can either use the CloudStack API or the AWS API in order to uh, to run this cloud. And uh, instead of having an e-commerce platform, you can buy an optional portal from Citrix, which can help you um, vend or you know sell the service if you're a public cloud, for example. All right, so that's 
um, you know the high level overview of Apache Cloud Stack. So, and then so that's the software stack. Well, what do you do with the hardware? So you start off with a bunch of hypervisors. Uh, for the purpose of the, this discussion, it's going to be Zen server. Um, you put them in a network and you attach some shared storage to it, and then you can start some VMs on it. But you're probably not going to be uh, limited to a few hypervisors, so you start adding more, and you connect those uh, uh, hypervisors to the uh, to the public internet so that the VMs have access to the internet. And then you start adding more and more um, subnets of hypervisors, kind of in a cookie cutter style. And uh, and then you tie it all together with uh, the cloud stack uh, management server cluster which will give you uh, an admin API and an end user API. Right? And then the, the cloud stack orchestration software uses MySQL and then it can communicate with the hypervisors to orchestrate the hypervisor. It can communicate with the storage and the network to orchestrate all three parts of the net of the uh, of your data center. And finally you get a uh, secondary storage which is uh, meant to be uh, large in scale. Uh, not necessarily perform it, but it's meant to store your uh, uh, more of a permanent uh, objects of a permanent nature like images and snapshots and ISOs. So uh, let's go through what happens when you start a VM through Cloud Stack in your um, data center. So uh, we have some images um, in the uh, in the secondary storage. So uh, when the API request comes into Cloud Stack to start a VM, we uh, we pick a free hypervisor, and then we tell the uh, we orchestrate the movement of uh, that that image from secondary storage to uh, the upper operate shared primary storage, and then uh, we tell the hypervisor to start the VM based on that image. And then uh, you can do other stuff like you can take a snapshot of that image and then um, start more VMs. And then finally, you want to be able to talk between uh, those two VMs. And so we will orchestrate then the network as well so that those two VMs have visibility into each other. So uh, diving a little bit more deeper into what multi-tenancy from a network perspective means, um, let's say you have these uh, two uh, racks of servers, um, rack one and rack two, and you have some Zen hypervisors there. And uh, tenant Joe comes in and starts a few uh, VMs. And, and because uh, depending on the occupancy of these hypervisors, you could start them anywhere in the on these hypervisors. It need not be in the same uh, broadcast domain. And uh, tenant David comes along and starts a few more VMs, and they could be on the same hypervisor that Joe is on. And Joe starts a few more VMs, and then Chris comes along and starts his own VMs as well. And now the challenge is, of course, that now you need to isolate at the network level between um, these tenants. And not only that, now these, these VMs require services at the edge of the internet, and so they want services like load balancing, they want firewalls, maybe VPNs, and so um, at the same time, these firewalls and VPNs have to be isolated from each other so that tenant A's traffic doesn't go into tenant B's traffic. And uh, diving even deeper, uh, Joe might actually want to run a regular multi-tenant, um, uh, sorry, a multi-tier application. So he's got a web tier, where, uh, and then which is isolated from the app tier, and then which is isolated from the DB tier. And now he wants to write rules saying that web tier can access the app tier, but not the database tier, and then the app tier can access the database tier, but not the web tier. And not just that, he wants to be able to load balance the web tier, um, maybe connect back through MPLS back into his, into his premises, or maybe use an IPsec or SSL VPN back to his um, 
his data center. And um, and if you look at the the sum total of all the services that we, that need to be orchestrated, it's not just the load balancer and the uh, and, and the and the VPN, but you need to do DHCP, DNS, some routing, some ACLs, um, do a little bit of NAT, power port forwarding, and and firewalling. So uh, this is what Apache Cloud Stack will take care of for you. So multiple tenants, Joes and Davids and Chris's, can come in and stand up these multi-tier um, web applications on shared infrastructure and then operate their uh, production or development workloads. So uh, what are our options here? So the first thing you could do is um, each network or tier could be isolated at L2, which is at the Ethernet level. So then each um, network would be a separate subnet. Uh, but it's also desirable, for example, that each tenant gets their own space and those spaces, under space, and those address spaces can overlap. Right? So if Joe has 1011 slash 24, then David might want exactly the same thing, and we should be able to support that. And uh, in, this, uh, in this scenario, it is assumed, for example, that all the web VMs are able to see each other in, at an L2 adjacency level. And uh, depending on the application needs, they may want to do multicast, broadcast, and for example, if they want to do an ARP resolution or a DNS SD resolution, they should be able to do that. Um, then there's another isolation method called L3 isolation. And what you do at L3 isolation is that you, um, you even though there are multiple tenants on the same hypervisor, you, you write rules on the hypervisor on DOM0 so that those VMs are not able to see each other, except when explicitly allowed by a rule um, programmed through the uh, CloudStack API. Uh, in this case, there's no L2 adjacency, no multicast, no broadcast, and uh, but it is a very scalable isolation method. And I'll explain. It's a little confusing, but I'll explain that in a, in a later slide. Last but not least, CloudStack will also support PVLAN, which is like a poor man's VLAN, uh, or to scale beyond a 4,000 VLANs. So what happens here is that multiple tenants are placed on the same VLAN. But then you, you, you write rules into the uh, OpenV switch in DOM0 so that they're only able to talk upstream via the router. So they're not able to communicate with, with each other, even though they're adjacent uh, on the L2 basis. And again, we don't allow multicast or broadcast. And this tend to, tends to have very limited use cases because once you cross the router, there's no isolation. So uh, when we talk about L2 isolation options in CloudStack, the first thing that jumps to mind is, is network virtualization. And this is the, the illusion that you're giving to your tenants that they're running on their own exclusive network, uh, even though they're on the shared network. So the first thing you do is you, the old standby, the VLAN, uh, it's been there for decades and uh, you can use uh, either OpenV switch or the bridge on Zen server, but then you're limited by the 12-bit identifier for the VLAN, so it gives you 4K VLANs. And not just that, most switches won't even support 4K VLANs that probably top out at 200 or 400. Um, and then the other downside of VLANs is that um, they need to be, all the VLANs need to be trunked down to all the hypervisors because when CloudStack starts its, uh, starts a VM in a particular VLAN, it can place that VM on any hypervisor, any available hypervisor. And so un unless the switches have already been set up to bring that VLAN down to that hypervisor, it's not going to work. So it kind of goes uh, against sensible networking design where uh, you don't really have to, should be trunking all VLANs to all the ports. Nevertheless, you know, VLANs are there, they're popular and they're understandable, network engineers understand them. And so that tends to be the most popular currently way of providing 
into isolation in Apache cloud stack deployments. The, the last option is the, the emerging option which is overlays and some of them sometimes conflated with uh, software defined networking. And so what you do is that you uh, run these tunnels between the hypervisors, either they're uh, VXLAN overlays or STT or GRE. And then when the Ethernet frame comes out of the, um, of the VM, you pop it up with a GRE header and then send it through the GRE tunnel. And then you can use, for example, the, the, the key, which is a 32-bit identifier in the GRE header as the discriminator between networks or between tenants. And uh, what this does require a, uh, an orchestrator to manage those overlays so that when you start up a VM, uh, the orchestrator needs to ensure that the overlay of the tunnel has been established before that VM is started. So when you virtualize the network either using VLANs or overlays, uh, this is what it looks like. So let's say you have one tenant here. He's got four VMs and then um, either th uh, through a physical device or a virtual appliance, he's getting some network services like you know, DHCP firewalling and, and NAT. Um, and then he's got you know, a few public addresses assigned to him or her. And now he decides that he wants you know, load balancing and VPN, so maybe we spin up more virtual appliances or uh, bring in more physical devices into the picture. And you can see the, the addressing scheme is uh, 1011 slash 24. But now tenant B comes in. He wants a, the same address space but a different set of services. So, um, and he gets a different set of public IPs. And so this is what network virtualization looks like when it's, um, when it's orchestrated by CloudStack. And so uh, when CloudStack implements this, it has a view of the physical infrastructure and then uh, by orchestrating the, the V switches and the other infrastructure in the cloud, it provides this virtualization uh, on top of the physical infrastructure. So to give you an example of what happens when, um, uh, when, uh, when CloudStack orchestrates VLANs, here at the bottom you have all the um, the VLANs which are needed uh, trunked into uh, the hypervisor and the hypervisor bonds these two NICs and, um, and then CloudStack knows for example that uh, tenant A and has uh, VLAN 10 and tenant B has VLAN 20 and tenant C has VLAN uh, 30 and then it, it programs the vSwitches or the bridge uh, so that these VMs are attached to the appropriate ports on the vSwitch or on the bridges. If you wanted to do uh, an, an overlay, then what CloudStack would do is, let's say um, you had this uh, fairly large uh, data center infrastructure separated by um, several subnets. Um, let's say this user one has um, La created four VMs on, on a network, CloudStack would um, program the open vSwitch on each of these hypervisors to uh, create GRE tunnels between these hypervisors so that uh, traffic for these, um, uh, between these VMs are carried on, the, on this tunnel. And the discriminator for the tunnel is the GRE key, which as I said before is the 32-bit key in the GRE header. And now if uh, user two comes along, uh, then we set up a different GRE, uh, tunnel potentially, or if he's using the same tunnel, he uses a different GRE key. And um, so that's, that's actually how CloudStack will do its native GRE SDN controller. Uh, but CloudStack has an extensible network model and an extensible is extensible in several ways, but networking is one of its strong spots. And over the, since Apache, uh, or since CloudStack went in the Apache Foundation, um, these are all the um, uh, integrations we have had uh, coming into CloudStack. Uh, NiceSera was the first, followed by uh, 
um, Midokura, um, Nuage, Big Switch, Stratosphere up out in Japan. And we just got um, notified that Juniper wants to donate a uh, uh, integration with Contrail. And uh, soon we'll start on an open daylight integration as well. So um, all these uh, technologies, SDN technologies, support network virtualization in some form or the other. And, and then they will integrate with Apache Cloud Stack as well. So coming back to the second mode where you don't virtualize the network, but you're trying to use the existing address, the physical address space that you already have. Um, in this example, tenant one has come in with two VMs. <clears throat> and uh, they've landed up in the same rack. And so they have um, you know, adjacent IP addresses or addresses in the same subnet. But as he starts new VMs, uh, Tenant 2 could come in into the same um, network. And Tenant 1, as he starts the new VM, goes into a separate subnet altogether. So you can see that these tenants do not have or, or adjacent or uh, L2 adjacent IP addresses. And so what happens is that um, CloudStack needs to make sure that, for instance, that even though tenant two and tenant one are L2 adjacent, they can't really see each other. So for this purpose, uh, CloudStack programs the IP tables in DOM zero to prevent this from happening. And by default, all the, tra all the traffic is dropped and unless the, the, the tenant writes an API rule saying that traffic is allowed between, for example, um, tenant one VM one and tenant one VM three. And as these VMs get uh, created and destroyed, um, CloudStack is busy updating the, the rules on these IP tables. And so to, to do this, you need uh, the packages, uh, the IP tables across the bridge, uh, because this does not work with OVS. Uh, the main reason being OVS does not provide a stateful firewall that is required to provide such a service. Um, it also requires an IP set package because as you start writing lots of these rules, IP table starts bogging down. And so then IP set forms a, is a very nice optimization package for IP tables. Um, it does not work with OVS, but then, and it, the advantage over VLANs is that it's in production, it has been shown to scale to tens of thousands of VMs and tenants. So CloudStack, so as, as you know, as a uh, the tour I'm giving you, you can see that CloudStack needs to deal with a bunch of different services for different tenants, um, all the way from L2 all the way through L7, and then operators of these clouds they want to use their own favorite way of isolation they were the, or, or providing these services, whether they're virtual appliances, hardware devices, SDN controllers, what have you. And some of them don't want isolation. Some of them want VLAN isolation. Some of them want overlays. Some of them want L3 isolation. So it's CloudStack's job to uh, abstract this complexity away uh, from the end user, because the end user, all he wants to do is create a network, right? And so what we do is we expose a service catalog, which the cloud operator designs through the admin API. So for example, let's say designs a, uh, a gold service offering which says this you get, whenever you create a uh, network with this offering, you get a load balancer, you get a firewall, and they all just use virtual appliances. But if you want to upgrade, then you can get the same things and a VPN using hardware appliances, right? And so the, um, here's an example. So the customer's running a dev environment. He's got a virtual appliance providing a low performance uh, experience, but he's got a bunch of useful services nonetheless in his network. And when he runs into production, he wants to use uh, hardware devices like the SRX firewall or the net secular load balancer. And then CloudStack will let him transparently upgrade to that configuration without changing his VMs. And uh, that was it. 
Um, there's more information, please come to the CloudStack Wiki, CloudStack user list, and contribute. Thanks. Any questions? Um, there's some work going on, I know, in Zen Server at the moment, looking at uh, doing security group stuff with OVS. Uh, can you comment on that and how that fits into um, the the uh, sort of you know, segmentation of the, the network? Certainly, yeah. So as it turns out, security groups it turns out to be useful even when you have uh, virtualization, network virtualization. It's not just L3 isolation um, because it, it pushes the hardware or the, the, the firewall down to where it, where it belongs next to the VM. And so that will be a very useful addition to, uh, to OBS. Uh, the way, for example, KVM does it today is they let you do IP tables and OVS at the same time. So you do OVS to do the switching, and then at the port, you could write IP table rules. So it gives you the best of both worlds. Maybe not performant, but at least it gives you some level of uh, integration. And I believe that's done by um, gluing a bridge and an OVS together that's and right. traffic passing it's over both. Yeah, as some would call it a Franken switch, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, the, with, um, the, I think the thing with the Zen server is going to be to try and put the right rules in to achieve the, 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 the sort of segregation of the MAC addresses, right. um, assuming we do it at that level, um, so that it can just be done in one pass very quickly, is I think what we're trying to achieve. Is, is okay, that, that, that'll, be, that'll be excellent, yeah. Okay, we got time for one last question. Anyone have a question? Okay. Let's uh, let's give Chair Deep a hand. <laughs> <laughs>